Hello, I think we can get started now. Um, I'm Sarah Lennox. I'm um, on the Northampton Neighbors Board, and I'm also on the Speaker Series Committee, which is um, the group that's been putting this Speaker Series together. Um, so what I'm going to do today is, uh, first I'm going to tell you a little bit about Northampton Neighbors. And um, then I'm going to tell you how the session today is going to function. And then I'll introduce Carrie Baker, our main feature. So about Northampton Neighbors. Uh, Northampton Neighbors launched in November 2017 after several years of um, thinking about it. And um, as of yesterday, we have 947 members, which is really quite terrific. Um, we are part of a national and international movement called the Village Movement. Um, and villages are um, virtual villages, not real live places. And they're dedicated to providing older people with the services and the social and cultural connections that they need to stay in their homes as they age. Um, Northampton Neighbors is open to anyone, anywhere um, as members, but we provide services, or at least we used to provide services before COVID um, to people over 55 living in Northampton, Florence and Leeds. Oh, one of the really great things about Northampton Neighbors is that it's free, which is which means that anyone can join, not just people with the means to do so. And we are we are one of the very few villages of you know about 400 or so that um, charges no fee. Um, so even though we're not providing services right now, and we won't until a lot more people are vaccinated. Uh, we found lots of other ways to um, help people make connections, um, which uh, most of which involve Zoom, including interest groups like a food interest group, a book group, a, a discussion group, um, a gardening group. Uh, we have neighborhood circles in the various neighborhoods around town, and um, then the speaker series. Um, those of you who've been around for a while um, probably remember that we had a great series of speakers in the senior center. And after the uh, shutdown came, we were uh, for a while a little confused about what we should do. And then we realized we could make use of this wonderful Zoom format as well. And the speaker series, uh, which we resumed in May 2020 has been just as great as the ones that we had in the Senior Center. Um, so if you've missed any of the uh, speaker series prior to this one, you can go on the Northampton Neighbors website, northamptonneighbors.org, and they're all there um, recorded by our wonderful tech guru, um, Nina Kleinberg, and you can watch them or even watch them again. Um, so what's going to happen today? Um, the way we ask questions is to use the chat function, which is at the bottom of your screen. It's a, it says chat with a little kind of cartoon balloon above it. Um, and you can type your questions into the chat and then don't forget to um, uh, hit return or they won't be recorded. Uh, we usually think it's better for people to wait until the talk is over to um, ask their questions because it might be that the speaker um, answers a question in the course of the talk. Uh, but if you, if you can't wait, just write it down and we'll, if, if Carrie happens to address it, you know, that's fine. Also um, in the top left-hand corner, you'll see a box that says Otter Live Notes or otter.ai. And that is a wonderful provision um, that will provide you a written transcript of what the speaker is going to say, uh, is, is saying in, in real time. So click on the down arrow and you'll see um, a browser window um, that provides a transcript of the talk as it's going on. 
um, and that's really terrific if you have trouble hearing or if you just like to read things as well as listen to them. Um, so Carrie's going to talk for about 30 minutes and then we'll have um, about 20 minutes for Q&A. So now to the main event and I'm going to tell you a little bit about Carrie. So Carrie is pretty amazing. Um, she, it was hard to squeeze this information out of her, but I went online and tracked it down anyway. Um, she is an amazing teacher at Smith College, a scholar, a journalist, and an activist. Uh, she's in the Smith Program for the Study of Women and Gender. Um, um, the, she was director, I think, until she went on sabbatical last semester. Um, her research focuses on women's legal history, gender and public policy, and feminist activism. Um, she's president of the Abortion Rights Fund of Western Massachusetts. She's a contributing editor to Ms. Magazine. And if her name and picture look familiar to you, it's because um, she writes a monthly column in the Gazette. Um, you might also recognize her, at least her name, uh, because she's a very talented photographer and at in the last um, Northampton Neighbors talent show, she showed us her photos of flowers on the Smith campus, which were very, very beautiful. So uh, now on with the show and Carrie, take it away. Great. Well, thank you so much, Sarah. I really appreciate it. Um, great to see everybody here. I'm going to put it on um, so I can see everybody on gallery view. Wonderful to see many of you. I know several of you and um, it's thank you so much for inviting me to be here today. So as Sarah said, I teach gender law and policy at Smith College. I focus a lot on women's rights, um, issues like reproductive rights, sexual harassment and other issues. And I teach in my class a lot about Supreme Court decisions and the you know decisions in various areas relating to women's rights. And so when we were planning this event today, um, Sarah and others said that they would really like to hear about what's going on with the Supreme Court right now, with the Trump administration having three appointments to the court and the court significantly moving to the right. And so I wanted to, today I want to start by talking about where we are on the court and how we got here. So I, I don't want to assume that anybody knows anything, although I'm sure that many of you know a whole lot, but I, I want to just kind of put us all on the same page. So I'm going to take a couple minutes and talk about who's currently on the court and where are they sort of on the political spectrum? How is the court divided and how has that evolved over the last, particularly the last three years? Then I want to talk a little bit about the implications of the current court composition for women's rights in particular, because that's my area. I mean, I could speak more broadly um, and I'll make a few more broad references, but the thing that I really know is kind of where we are as far as women's rights. And then the third part of my talk, I wanna say a little bit about um, if you're a women's rights advocate as I am, what, how do you respond to the current Supreme Court as far as you know your own activism or your own energy and efforts to try to continue to expand women's rights. Um, is the Supreme Court a lost cause uh, or you know, are there other strategies that might be used? And I want to um, in particular hold up an article that I wrote for Ms. Magazine um, a couple months ago and um, I'm gonna share it with you in the chat box just so um, I will be talking about this but I wanted to share it with you. Um, this was kind of an op-ed of a piece where I'm arguing for expanding the number of justices on the Supreme Court, which I know is a kind of dicey thing. And um, I just kind of put the case out there. And so I'll talk a little bit about that, um, about what that would mean, what the options are, and um, and you know whether that would be a good idea or not. So that that's the lay of the land. And I wanna start by sharing my screen and talking a little bit about where we are on the court. So in the final year of Obama's presidency, um, there was a death on the court of um, a conservative justice who'd been on the court for quite a while, Scalia. And that left eight members on the court. And this 
uh, breakdown actually was in a decision called Whole Women's Health, which was an abortion rights decision involving a Texas law that had been challenged. The Texas law put in place, and I won't get into details here, but significant restrictions on abortion access. The case went all the way up to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court divided along the lines that you see here. The majority, there were only eight on the court at the time because of um, Scalia's death. The court divided five to three. Kennedy, who for a long time had been considered the swing vote, sided with the four liberals on the court. Um, Justice Ginsburg, RBG, which I'm sure you all know about, Justice Breyer, who's a Clinton appointee, who is not real liberal, but is on the liberal end of the court. Um, Elena Kagan, who was appointed by Obama, and Sotomayor, who was also appointed by Obama. Um, the minority were uh, three, the three judges at the bottom. Roberts, who is currently the Chief Justice, um, Thomas, who is um, was appointed by Bush, the first Bush, and Alito. And so this was um, kind of surprising, although not entirely surprising, but they handed down the whole women's health decision and it was really a groundbreaking decision for abortion rights. Because in a nutshell, they reinforced Roe versus Wade and they actually strengthened it by saying that legislatures can't just pass restrictions on abortion by saying, oh, it, it's for women's health if there was no medical evidence to support that position. And it required the courts and lower courts to balance the benefit of a law versus the burden of a law. And this really was significant because in conservative states across the United States, legislatures were passing laws that clearly had no medical benefit that were really aimed just to restrict access to abortion, but the legislatures were claiming it was for women's health. So what this decision said is, you know, you can't just make stuff up. It was actually before all the fake facts stuff, it, but it was sort of anticipating it. Um, the court said, you have to actually um, provide some justification when you're trying to put a burdensome restriction on access to abortion. So this was the breakdown on that decision in 2016. Well, as we know, um, in the final year of Obama's presidency, Scalia passed away and he nominated Merrick Garland, who, um, by the way, I don't know how many people know, Merrick Garland's father um, lived in the Valley. He was a doctor mm -hmm. here, actually. And he was actually involved in abortion rights um, before Roe versus Wade. He was part of the clergy consultation service and was um, an advocate on abortion rights, just a little tidbit. And that's Merrick Garland's father um, of the same name. But anyway, um, Obama nominated Garland. And by the way, I'm sure you've seen Biden has recently nominated Garland as attorney general. Um, Garland's a pretty moderate guy. Obama picked a moderate guy because he wanted to try to get Republican support to get um, the nomination affirmed, but Mitch McConnell refused to even hold a hearing, refused to allow a vote. And even though Scalia had died in February of 2016, he kept the position open for over nine months until Trump got into office. And at the time, a number of conservative members of Congress pledged that they... Um, you know, would not, um, you know, they said that, that um, I'll just say Senator Lindsey Graham promised that if there were a Republican president in 2020 and the seat opened up on the Supreme Court, that he would be, uh, he would let the next president make the nomination. He said, I want you to use my words against me. You can use my words against me and you'd be absolutely right. Well, now, of course, we know what happened in 2020 when a position opened because of the death of RBG, Republicans kind of went back on that, on that pledge and promise. So what happened was, is they held the seat open until Trump got into office. And then once Trump got into office, he appointed uh, Neil Gorsuch. So, um, uh, I'm, excuse me, when he got into office, he, yeah, he appointed 
right here, Neil Gorsuch in the upper right hand corner. And Neil Gorsuch is a very conservative candidate. And what happened is, is about that same time, the Republicans in the Senate got rid of the filibuster rule for Supreme Court appointments. So they could uh, um, confirm much more conservative candidates than historically was the case. Up until then, the filibuster rule was in place, so you had to have 60 votes in order to confirm a Supreme Court justice. But because they got rid of the filibuster rule, they only needed just a majority. And so Gorsuch was quite to the right, and they were able to confirm his position to fill Scalia's position. Then shortly after that, in 2018, Justice Kennedy uh, decided to step down. Now, Justice Kennedy was a conservative. He was appointed by a Republican president, Ronald Reagan, and but he had sort of turned into a swing vote. And so the court historically has often been pretty balanced with a swing vote, like um, Justice O'Connor, Sandra Day O'Connor was a swing vote. Sometimes she'd go conservative, sometimes she'd go more liberal. Um, and, and that's really how the court has been for quite a long time. But now with, with Gorsuch on the bench and then Kennedy stepping down, Trump appointed uh, Brett Kavanaugh or nominated Brett Kavanaugh. Now you all I'm sure remember the controversies around Brett Kavanaugh's nomination. Again, he was quite an extreme conservative um, and uh, he also had allegations of sexual assault brought against him during his confirmation process. But despite that, a slim majority of the Senate confirmed the appointment of Brett Kavanaugh to the Supreme Court. So the court moved to be a solid 5-4 split between conservatives and liberals. There was no longer this middle swing vote that might go either way like Kennedy. There was five solid conservatives and four more progressive people. Then, of course, what happened the next year is um, that you had the death of RBG, of Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who was the quintessential women's rights activist. She argued a lot of the early women's rights cases when she was head of the ACLU's Women's Rights Project. And this was, of course, in the waning days of Trump's presidency. Um, it, she, uh, RBG died in October. And basically, Republicans in the Senate fast-tracked an extremely conservative nomination from Trump, Amy Coney Barrett, who's in the bottom right-hand corner, to be on the Supreme Court. And, you know, despite the pledges that people like Lindsey Graham and others had made in 2016, when um, uh, Scalia had died, and there was nine months to go, and they basically just left the position open in hopes that a Republican would be elected, which one was, um, they then um, flipped and said, no, we need to fill this seat right away. And so the court basically in a sh few short years went from a, a balanced 4-4 with a swing leaning conservative Justice Kennedy to a solid 6-3 conservative supermajority. So again, the, the liberals, just looking at this, the liberals are Sotomayor, Breyer, and Kagan. Um, and then the conservatives are Alito, Roberts, Thomas, Kavanaugh, Gorsuch, and Amy Coney Barrett. So that's kind of where we stand right now. Um, this is another way of looking at it, just so that you can see kind of who was nominated by Republicans, who was nominated by Democrats. And, and again, you know, the court has always been, had sort of a mix of appointees by Democrats and Republicans, but the last three justices, Gorsuch, Kavanaugh, and Barrett, were appointed without the filibuster rule, and they were much more extremely right candidates. The filibuster rule had a sort of moderating influence so that people that got onto the court you know, had to get some Democratic buy-in. And many, many, many members of the court have been confirmed with, you know, 80, 90 votes. RBG, who's actually a pretty progressive person, had over 90 votes in favor. Whereas the last three 
had just bare majorities. So this has really had an influence on the you know, people's expectations about what the court might do and their hopes or, you know, fears about what the court might do. I just want to show you one more, um, one more picture here. So, um, so we went again from this balance of, you know, in the whole woman's health decision with five justices interested or supporting abortion rights and three opposing them to this, where these six um, red circle justices oppose abortion and the three at the bottom favor it. So a real shift and a, a decision recently came down, which I won't get into, but about a month ago, that it was an abortion related decision and it fell exactly along these lines with only three just judges dissenting against an anti-abortion decision that came down involving telemedicine abortion during the pandemic. Uh, which I can speak more about if you're interested. Um, so this also gives you a little bit of a sense of where on the political spectrum people fall. Um, again, all the way over on the left is the most left members of the court. Um, of course, RBG is now gone, but Sotomayor and Kagan. Breyer is sort of here to the left of the center, but, but much to the right of Kagan and Sotomayor. And then you have the right wing folks. Now, of course, um, Kennedy is gone, as is Scalia. Um, you have Roberts, Thomas, and Alito. Uh, the new folks are to the right of them. So this whole scale would have to be moved over to incorporate Amy Coney Barrett, Neil Gorsuch, and, um, and uh, Kavanaugh. Okay, so I'm just, I'm gonna stop there, stop my screen sharing. So that's where we are. So if you're somebody interested in women's rights or if you're interested in racial equity or voting rights or democracy, quite frankly, or that maybe have been a little polemical, but that's my, I'm, you know, I'm, I believe that. Um, or, you know, climate, if you're concerned about the climate or any number of issues, this current Supreme Court should really concern you. Um, so that's how we got where we are. Um, Democrats, many Democrats, many on the left, feel like Republicans stole two seats. That by holding open the um, Scalia seat for nine months and then filling it, you know, after Trump took office, removing the filibuster and then appointing Amy Coney Barrett within the span of about six weeks, that first of all, that's kind of a double standard, especially when they promised so much that they wouldn't do that. And second of all, that they, um, um, you know, that they're appointing these much more extreme candidates. You know, people on the left feel like, you know, they've at least one seat, maybe two seats have been stolen and that they've put quite conservative people in place. So somebody just asked, well, Breyer perhaps retired during Biden administration so that Biden can make a liberal appointment. I think he very well might. I, I'm not exactly sure how old Breyer is, but he was appointed by Clinton and he is one of the older members on the court. So I think that is possible that he may do that. You know, uh, many people think about RBG not stepping down during Obama and they're quite sorry about that in retrospect, um, you know, but it's a lifetime appointment. So we can't always, um, you know, people are going to do what they're going to do. By the way, I just want to drop into the box a piece I wrote about um, what happened with the Amy Coney Barrett nomination um, and, uh, you know, kind of the hypocrisy um, of the fact that they seated um, Gorsuch and or held open the seat and then seated Gorsuch, but then they so quickly appointed Amy Coney Barrett and the ways in which many members of the Senate sort of flipped their position. And, you know, when it was um, the Scalia seat, they're like, oh, we promise we won't hold, you know, we won't, um, we'll let a Democratic president appoint in 2020. Um, but then they, they went back on that promise once the question actually um, 
came up. So, um, all right, so let me move on to the next part, the implications for rights and women's rights in particular. So I'll just, I mean, there's a lot of things that I could talk about, um, you know, for instance, sexual harassment law. I mean, the Supreme Court often hears decisions involving sexual harassment law or sexual violence. And conservatives on the court tend to be conservative about how they interpret the law and, you know, hand down decisions that make it harder for women who have faced sexual harassment or sexual abuse. Um, but I wanna focus on two areas in particular. And one is reproductive rights, because I've already talked about that a little bit. But the other is the Equal Protection Clause and um, protections that women have against state discrimination based on sex and what the current makeup of the court, what that might mean for women's rights in that area. So many of the um, conservative justices, so I mentioned there's a super majority of six conservative justices, they fall in the category of being originalists or um, which, which, and there, many of them are members of the Federalist Society. What an originalist is, is somebody that interprets the constitution as the people who adopted it would have understood it. So they say that, when we are interpreting the Constitution, we need to look to the framers, the people that wrote the Constitution, and determine what did they mean by the words and the clauses that they had in the Constitution, and we should interpret it the same way today. So an example is the 14th Amendment of the Constitution was passed shortly after the Civil War, and it was passed to protect the rights of the newly freed African Americans. And it, protect, it said that states should guarantee equal protection of the laws. They should guarantee equality. And there's a long line of jurisprudence. Originally, the court interpreted that basically to not provide much protection at all. But in the 60s, with the civil rights movement and people um, like Thurgood Marshall and NAACP arguing for stronger rights for African Americans, the court under the Warren Court finally interpreted the Equal Protection Clause to protect against discrimination based on race. So if a state passes a law that discriminates based on race, the Supreme Court began to strike down those laws. An example is Loving versus Virginia, the Virginia law that prohibited interracial marriage the Supreme Court in 1963 struck down that law. And the court began to use the 14th Amendment to strike down a whole range of racially discriminatory laws. But shortly after that, the Supreme Court began to get cases involving sex discrimination. Many of these cases were brought by Ruth Bader Ginsburg, none other than RBG. And what she did is she used that interpretation relating to race, but she transferred it to sex. And she says, well, if states are supposed to provide equal protection to everybody, then shouldn't they protect men and women equally? And at first the court kind of resisted that, but eventually in 1971, the court began to strike down sexually discriminatory laws, a whole range of different kinds of laws. Um, and by 1976, the court had created a new standard that allowed them to strike down many discriminatory laws. For example, laws that if um, a married couple, um, both, uh, there was a law involving administrators of an estate. And if a mother and a father were both equally qualified to be an administrator of their child's, their deceased child's estate, there was a state law that said, well, we'll automatically give it to the husbands rather than the wives or the mothers rather than the fathers. That case went all the way to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court struck down that law because they said it was based on archaic stereotypes about men being better with business matters than women. And there were many other laws that were struck down. So where are we today? The court has maintained that jurisprudence, but an originalist interpretation of the 14th Amendment would say that was not what those guys back after the Civil War meant by passing the 14th Amendment. And in fact, 
Many of the more conservative members of the court has said the 14th Amendment doesn't provide any protection based on sex discrimination. There's a famous quote by Scalia saying, clearly that was not intended by the framers of the 14th Amendment. And, you know, if you want protection in the Constitution, you have to pass the Equal Rights Amendment. Well, we know that we don't have an Equal Rights Amendment. So all we have is the 14th Amendment. So I, that's one example. I think that the six conservative members of the court, certainly at least five of them, would be very willing to strike down that interpretation of the Equal Protection Clause that protects women's rights. Another area that is very likely to impact women's rights is, is reproductive rights. I think that it's very likely that the Supreme Court will strike down Roe versus Wade and potentially even other Supreme Court decisions related to that, like Griswold versus Connecticut that protects access to contraception, potentially even Lawrence versus Texas, which struck down criminal sodomy laws targeted at LGBT people. So I think there's a lot at stake for people that believe in civil rights, people that believe in human rights with the current court. I think that, you know, the court is has been conservative for a while, but I think it can go a lot further to the right. And so I would um, just, um, you know, I'm very concerned as somebody that believes in civil rights about the impact of this court. We have looked to the court really for quite a while, but certainly since Board, uh, Brown versus Board of Education, we have looked to the court to protect minority rights. You know, we live in a democracy where majority rule is what makes our laws. If you're a minority or a, discriminatory, a discriminated against group, like women are not a minority, but they're only, you know, they're less than, um, you know, they're a, mi they're a minority in Congress, they're a minority in the Massachusetts legislature, right? We only have about 25% women in the Massachusetts legislature. So, you know, often women's rights aren't at the top of the agenda. And that's why the civil rights movement, the women's rights movement, the gay rights movement, they've turned to the courts to vindicate their minority rights because they haven't been able to get a majority to vote give them their rights, even if, you know, I mean, one argument is nobody should have to have their rights voted on, but we live in a society where that has been the case. And so my concern is with the Supreme Court becoming so conservative and no longer able to um, uh, turn to the courts for the vindication of their rights, that we're going to be at a real disadvantage. Um, you know, one response is that these groups have got to mobilize and organize and demand their rights. And I think that's in part what's happening now. But um, again, the courts have been a really important backstop forever. And so, um, so I'm going to move to the third part of what I wanted to talk about is, so what do we do? You know, and I think there's a number of different, I'm going to talk about three different possible strategies. Uh, one is to somehow address the structure or the process of the Supreme Court to try to have more balance or try to kind of address the, the theft of the two seats. And I'll, I'll talk about that. A second approach is to turn away from the court and turn towards the states. Um, and so I wanna talk a little bit about like what we've done here in Massachusetts with regard to abortion rights to protect those rights in the in the pot, you know, if the court were to the Supreme Court were to strike down Roe versus Wade, there's been a lot of activism here at the state level directly in response to what's happened to the court to try to address that. And so I'll tell you a little bit about that. The third thing I want to talk about is just continuing to file lawsuits and make good arguments and try to convince the conservatives on the court to side with the progressive views. And so I want to talk about each of those things because I think they they each have, and, and I'm not saying these are exclusive approaches. Um, maybe we do all three, but I think that all of them have, have good possibilities and good, um, you know, hope. So let me talk about first, probably the most controversial of those three suggestions, which is um, I'm going to basically just summarize this piece that I dropped in the um, 
chat, which is a piece I wrote for Ms. Magazine called Hashtag Unpack the Court, Amy Coney Barrett and the Case for Expanding the Number of Justices. So um, as I mentioned, Amy Coney Barrett was nominated by Trump to fill a seat left open by the death of RBG, who died in late September, just 46 days before the 2020 election. Now, remember, Scalia died 264 days before the 2016 election. Senate Republicans had abolished the filibuster rule, um, and they then um, appointed, appointed Amy Coney Barrett. So I, in this piece, I, I, I introduce it by talking about that. And I, I talk about, so many people on the left are very angry about what the Republicans did, and a lot of ideas bubbled forth about how can we address this? What can we do? One suggestion was impose term limits. Justices on the Supreme Court are there forever. Now, back when they gave them lifetime appointments, they didn't, people didn't live nearly as long as they do now, right? And so now a justice appointed who's in their 40s can be on the court for 40 years, for two generations. That gives the president incredible power. And so some people said, why don't we impose term limits so that they're not there and so the stakes won't be quite as high, there'll be more turnover on the court, and so potentially there'll be more balance. Well, one problem with that is the lifetime appointment thing, it's in the Constitution. So it would take a constitutional amendment to get rid of that. A constitutional amendment is really hard to get. So I kind of say that's not very likely. Another option is to reform the nomination and confirmation process, such as requiring a two thirds vote of the Senate or confirmation from both houses of Congress. Um, you know, that would be in some way, um, you know, like restoring the filibuster plus a little more. Um, you know, the problem with that is it could be gridlock, who knows. Um, another suggestion and this is interesting, is national elections for the Supreme Court or requiring a 7-2 vote to overturn congressional acts. So there have been a number of different suggestions um, that are out there, but the one I wanna focus on and the one that I argue for in this piece is, and I know this is controversial and I'm not 100% convinced we should put our eggs in this basket, but in this piece, I make this argument or I pull the arguments in favor of this position, is to expand the number of justices on the Supreme Court. So let me just briefly tell you how I make this argument. And I realize that I'm getting behind, so I'm gonna to try to accelerate. Um, so a number of constitutional scholars have argued, first of all, you, didn't, you wouldn't need to do this by a constitutional amendment. You could do it by an act of Congress. A number of constitutional scholars have said that you'd be totally justified in increasing the size of the court. And um, so, and I'm actually, I'm just gonna leave the, the, op, the pieces uh, in the chat. I'm gonna leave it for you to read because I realize I'm running a little short on time and I don't want to, um, I don't want to go on too long. But some of the points I make is the court has not always been nine justices. It's actually ranged from six justices to 10 justices over time. So the number nine is not like, um, you know, a sacred number or anything. Another thing is, is that the US population has grown eightfold since 1869, um, when the Judicial Circuit Act um, uh, set the number of justices that are uh, currently there. In 1869, there were only 72 lower court federal judges. Today, there are 861. So lower court, the lower court judges have increased 12 fold, but the Supreme Court is still only nine justices. The caseload in the lower court has expanded dramatically and yet, you know, the same number of justices. The Supreme Court today receives 19 times more petitions than they did in 1892. Um, 841 versus 48,000 cases today. They take less than 1% of the cases filed before them. And the problem with that is that really limits their ability to resolve conflicts among the circuits. 
and to make the law uniform across circuits. Also, cases have increasing complexity. And so I argue in this piece that really having more justices and figuring out a way for there to be more review of more cases would be a way of meeting increased need for judicial review and creating greater uniformity across the courts. And then I talk a little bit about um, how having more justices would decrease the stakes in any one given nomination. Um, you know, with presidents nominating younger people, the stakes are getting so high. And so I make this case um, for, um, for potentially expanding the number of just judges to, you know, maybe 15. Um, and that is a way of not only dealing with this theft of two seats, but also with these other problems as far as um, the court. So that's one option. Um, you know, with, with now Congress controlled by Democrats, but with such a slim majority, um, it's probably unlikely to happen. I don't even know if all 50 Democrats would support it. Um, they'd certainly have to get rid of the filibuster rule to do it. But, um, and what Biden has said is that he will appoint a commission to investigate expanding the number of courts, which means, you know, kind of probably it's not gonna happen. But, um, so that's one option. Another, um, so that's one option how to deal with such a conservative court is try to get uh, more justices that reflect the country more accurately, that for, have, a more, have more political balance. So let's say you don't think that's a good idea or you, know, you, you wanna sort of find other ways to deal with what's been going on. Another thing is just continue to file lawsuits and take cases to the Supreme Court and hope that some of the conservative justices will moderate. I mean, one promising sign is in the Bostock decision, which was the case involving LGBTQ discrimination, Gorsuch sided with the liberals to create a progressive majority to say that sex discrimination includes discrimination based on sexual orientation and gender identity discrimination. This was a decision that it was before Amy Coney Barrett got on the court, but it, um, you know, it shows that even a real staunch conservative like Gorsuch might vote in a progressive way on particular cases. So, you know, if you're making good enough arguments, maybe you can convince them. Actually, that case was interesting because, of course, many originalists are also textualists, which will just look at the text and interpret the text. Um, Gorsuch is a textualist, and so he interpreted the word sex to include sexual orientation, um, you know, which I think is a strong argument, but uh, is certainly not the conservative perspective historically. Um, you know, the thing about um, this argument is, you know, Blackman, who wrote Roe versus Wade, was a Republican appointee. And actually, the 7 2 majority in Roe versus Wade, most of the seven in the majority were conservatives appointed by Republicans. Now, abortion wasn't such a partisan issue back then, but I do think that, you know, Kennedy moved towards the center. People, you know, O'Connor moved towards the center. People aren't always, they don't always stay where they are. That said, I think the current Supreme Court and the, and the majority, um, excuse me, the conservatives on the court, because of the elimination of the filibuster, they're much more extreme conservative conservatives. So I'm not real optimistic about this approach. Um, I mean, I think progressive have to, have to still defend decisions at the Supreme Court, but I would not recommend that any progressive group file a case to try to get to the Supreme Court to vindicate rights, because I don't think they're going to do it. The third approach, and this is one that I've actually been taking sort of at, when the rubber hits the road, is to turn our advocacy more towards the state level. I think that we put too many of our eggs in the federal basket. And I think that states, particularly states like Massachusetts, but other states as well, we don't use them enough to try to vindicate rights for progressive causes. Um, and I'll just tell you a little bit about the Roe Act, which was abortion legislation recently passed in the state of Massachusetts. After Kavanaugh got confirmed to the Supreme Court in 28, abortion rights activists in Massachusetts were really concerned about the state of abortion rights. 
And they went to their legislators and they passed what was called sort of humorously, the Nasty Woman Act, which removed a lot of the criminal abortion laws that were still on the books from pre-Roe times. And that was a direct response to the Kavanaugh appointment because they were concerned about Roe being overturned. Well, then in 2018, when Amy Coney Barrett got appointed to the court, Massachusetts, the Massachusetts legislature passed what was called the Roe Act, which was a very progressive abortion rights legislation that created an affirmative right to abortion in the state of Massachusetts and removed a number of restrictive laws that have been in place in the state since the 70s. And I really think that turning to the states to protect rights that might disappear because of the current Supreme Court is a really important strategy, particularly for people living in progressive states like Massachusetts. Now, if you live in Texas, it's pretty hopeless. But many states, I think, can turn to the states and uh, uh, many activists in more progressive states really need to turn to their state legislatures and pass laws to protect rights in a whole range of areas. Now, that's a lot more work to go to each state legislature and try to pass laws. Um, that's why people tend to try to go to the Supreme Court to get laws passed because you can just wipe out a lot of bad laws all at once. But I think that option with the current Supreme Court is greatly diminished. And so I, I think that we really are going to have to turn more to states and even local city councils to get protections passed. All right, I've gone way too long. So I want to open up for questions. And uh, thank you for your patience. So um, the Speaker Series Committee decided we would not unmute to clap. But if you wish to clap, uh, <laughs> with your thank hand. You. Um, so thank you so much, Carrie. That was really fascinating and wonderful. So I'm just going to give you a few, uh, a little word from your sponsor, and then we'll go to the Q&A. So if you're thinking of questions, um, you might want to put them in the chat right now so that we can turn to them um, as soon as my word from the sponsor is over. So first of all, I want to tell you that um, about the talks that are coming up, um, these uh, speaker series talks happen every other Friday at three o'clock on February 26th. Our next talk is by Doug Amy, and the title is The Country That Democracy Left Behind. So we may be continuing this theme. And then on March 12th, our speaker is going to be Marshall Carpell, and he is speaking about mRNA, lipids and proteins, oh my, COVID and the vaccines. Um, so stay tuned for that. And now uh, a real word from your sponsor. As you heard um, before, Northampton Neighbors doesn't charge any fee. So we're dependent on donations. So if you are able to do this, and we know not everybody can do so, especially right now, um, we'd really appreciate your helping us out um, by going to our website, www.northamptonneighbors.org, clicking on the donate button and um, giving us a little support or more than a little. And you can donate by credit card, uh, by PayPal or by check. And now your questions. And um, so, um, Sarah, I've just been looking them over. Okay. So why don't I just respond? So okay. um, Elaine Powers asks, if Roe versus Wade is overturned, doesn't federal law override state law? So there isn't any federal law on abortion. Uh, like Congress has never passed a law saying it's legal or illegal. Um, basically that state law covers abortion rights until the Supreme Court held that restrictions on abortion under the 14th Amendment, um, it you know, restrictions or bans on abortion violate the 14th Amendment um, uh, liberty. And so there is no federal law. Congress could pass a law. I, I don't think they're going to, but they could pass a law. They've tried to. Conservatives for many years have tried to get a human life amendment passed or a federal law prohibiting abortion. Um, I think more likely, particularly if the filibuster disappears, is that Congress will pass a federal law protecting abortion rights. And that is another strategy that I think is very possible 
Biden has come out in support of that law. Um, I think it's called the Women's Health Protection Act. And I, if you go to my Ms. Magazine articles, I've done a lot of writing on this issue and there are links to that. Um, there is federal law on federal funding of abortion. Um, and that's a little different. It's called the Hyde Amendment. Um, but as far as federal law, um, you know, the only federal law is Roe versus Wade, which basically limits the state's ability to prohibit abortion or restrict abortion. I also got a comment from Amy Douglas. Could you comment on the fact that the last three justices were appointed by a president who won only a minority of the popular vote and a Republican Senate that repre represents only a minority of American voters? You know, I think this is a really great question because it points out the feeling that people, particularly on the left, have that uh, about the illegitimacy, particularly of these last three appointments, and the the feeling that the Supreme Court doesn't represent the nation, that who is on the Supreme Court currently, um, sort of politically as well in, as in other respects, is not a democratic institution. And the court's not supposed to be democratic per se, but it's supposed, you know, it can't, the fact that it's so far out of line, I mean, you know, 80% of Americans support Roe versus Wade or, or maybe even more. And the fact that six out of nine justices oppose Roe versus Wade, I mean, you get a sense of how skewed it is. And that's not a healthy thing for a democracy. I, I, I would agree that it, that, you know, and, and quite frankly, you know, the, the, the fact that the Republican Senate only represents a minority of a voter. I mean, this is a holdover from the Civil War and from slavery. The fact that, you know, the whole way that the Electoral College and the um, the Senate itself, you know, to, um, uh, you know, or not even, you know, even before the Civil War, just, just I think that we have structural racism built into the very system of our government and that that ends up playing out in um, exactly what you raise, Amy. Um, okay, what upcoming case are you most worried about in terms of women's rights? So there are about 30 abortion rights cases bubbling up through the system, and it's unclear what's going to be first, but I think it's going to be a Louisiana case that basically bars abortion after 15 weeks. And I think it's very likely that the court will uphold that, which won't directly overturn Roe, but it will it will continue to erode Roe, which has been the historic strategy of the right around abortion. Of course, now, and if you've followed the news at all within the last week or two, many states are now passing these outright abortion bans because they see the Supreme Court as a very promising target now. They want to pass a ban and they want it to get to the Supreme Court so that Roe will be just wiped out, just completely banned. And so, you know, that's one area, but I will say there are many, many cases coming up. I mean, for instance, the Affordable Care Act could disappear. I mean, one really controversial thing about Amy Coney Barrett's appointment was she would provide the fifth vote to strike down the Affordable Care Act. And um, she explicitly wrote against that, the Affordable Care Act, before she got on the court. And so there's a real, there's real concern that she will strike that down. I, the Affordable Care Act was the, and people don't think about it like this, but it's true, it was the most important women's rights legislation in decades. Why? Because it prohibited sex discrimination in health insurance. And women experienced, before ACA, experienced a tremendous amount of sex discrimination. Many insurance plans wouldn't cover maternity care, for instance. Or they, you know, they would charge women higher rates than men. Um, in addition, the Affordable Care Act requires that the um, when you're when you're covering um, prescription drugs, that you cover contraception. It used to be that insurance companies could just refuse to cover contraception, and it was not sex discrimination. It was just I don't want to cover this drug. Yeah, I'll cover Viagra, but I'm not going to cover. Well, the Affordable Care Act said you can't do that, and not only do you have to cover contraception, but you have to cover it without a copay. So it and and you know as a result, 
there's a lot less unwanted pregnancy, a lot less abortion because contraception has become much more accessible because of the Affordable Care Act. If the Supreme Court strikes it down, women are going to suffer and women's health are going to suffer. Suffer. So, I mean, those are just a few examples. I see more, but I know we only have one minute. Sarah? You can, you can go on a little bit. Get, go on, Carrie, if, if you okay. have time. Okay. What's the current strategy for uh, passing the ERA? Well, this is my specialty. I can come back and do a whole talk on the ERA. Um, and I wrote a feature piece in Ms. Magazine on this. So if you go to my page, you can read all about it. But basically, um, 38 states have now ratified the Equal Rights Amendment. Virginia was the 38th state they ratified in January of 2020. The Trump administration blocked certification of the ERA, even though it had 38 states ratifying it. So now um, it's in court. People are lobbying Biden to allow the certification of the ERA. I think Biden will do that. He has not done it yet. I think that it will end up in court. Um, there is now legislation pending before the Senate and the House to eliminate the arbitrary timeline that Congress put in the preamble to the ERA. Um, that was not in the part that was ratified by the states and constitutional scholars across the board say that Congress can eliminate that time deadline, in which case the Equal Rights Amendment would be the 28th Amendment amendment of the constitution and finally guarantee equal rights. That's a real nutshell version, but if you wanna know more, um, I can share the, um, I wrote a feature cover story for Ms. about six months ago on this topic. Mm -hmm. And um, and I continue to write with Ms. on this topic. So you can, you can get all the details there. Um, there's another question about, um, the originalists and how they justify um, gun rights for automatic weapons, which you wouldn't think would be in the original, um, what the framers came up with. Well, that's the absurdity about originalism is how do you decide what the framers would think about computers or semi-automatic weapons or right. all these things that don't exist? Um, contraception for that matter, you know, the pill didn't exist mm -hmm. in 18 whatever. And so, it's to me, this is an absurd uh, position. And often, in my mind, people that are originalists really are more, they'll do whatever they, I mean, they're just trying to justify a conservative result. And it's not all that um, consistent. I think that, you know, they find ways of interpreting the language to say, you know, um, that, you know, the Constitution doesn't bar it, so therefore it should be allowed. Um, I'm not a gun rights um, expert, so I can't really get into more detail about exactly how they justify those positions, but I feel like often there's not a lot of, in my mind, intellectual um, consistency. It's more about mm -hmm. politics. So here's another question. How much will precedent restrain the newer justices? I, I, you know, I, I'm not sure. But um, I mean, this came up because there was a decision, June Medical Services, which was the exact same case as the whole women's health. Yet at that point, there was now a conservative majority, but it was before Amy Coney Barrett. And Roberts actually sided with the liberals to uphold that precedent because it had been just four years earlier and he felt like it was too ridiculous. It's the exact same law, just another different state. Whole Women's Health was Texas, Louisiana was the June Medical Services, and he just couldn't quite stomach just flipping so quickly because of a different makeup of the court. Um, that said, in his concurrence, he said, but I still don't like Roe, and I still don't think it was well decided, and I am welcome. I welcome you to file suits to erode it. So, you know, I think that there is some lip service to starry decisis or precedent. Mm -hmm. But I, I have no illusions that um, that Roe, I mean, whether it's directly overturned or just absolutely gutted, I'm sure it will be absolutely gutted. I mean, it, in some respects, it already is. But um, I, I'm not real optimistic. Again, I think if people want to do it, they'll do it and they'll find a way of, of you know, I mean, Rose, an old decision. It's out of date. I mean, they'll find ways of, of overturning it. 
but maybe that's, maybe I'm being too cynical. Um, I think that's all the questions. Do you want to give us a final word, Carrie? Well, I, I realize we're over time, but I just want to thank everybody for being here today. And I always say, by the way, to my students, feel free to disagree with me. I mean, I'm just, this is what I, these are ideas and thoughts that I've come to. I study this a lot, but I'm always, you know, like my position on packing the court. I mean, I know that there's arguments on both sides and I know that, you know, and so I'm always welcoming people to disagree with me. And I, I love to engage with different opinions and, and, you know, be able to, uh, you know, I always in my classes play the devil's advocate because I feel like, you know, we need to strengthen their, our own arguments by, by engaging with counter arguments. So I, I definitely, um, you know, invite that. And, and if anybody wants to follow up with me, my email is cbaker at smith.edu. It's very easy. Great. Okay, so thank you very much, Carrie. This was really wonderful. Um, many, many clapping, even though, even though we nobody we can't hear you can't hear the clapping, but much clapping anyway. And so thank, thank you. you so much. And um, everybody, come back in two weeks and hear Doug, Amy talk about um, democracy in the U.S., which um, might also be well. On the one hand, democratic, and and on the other. Uh, um, on, on the one hand, depressing, but on the other hand, give us something good to struggle for. Okay, so see you in two weeks, everybody. Bye-bye.